Turn to Habakkuk, please, the second chapter. Habakkuk 2 and 4. Uh, they've got it on the screen for us. If you're looking for it in your Bible, it's uh, go to uh, Malachi and start backing up. And you, you'll get there. But Habakkuk 2, 4. And let's release faith and believe to hear from the Lord right now. Prayer of agreement. Father, in Jesus' name, all of us agree together and everybody watching online, we ask you for the anointing that teaches and reveals. We ask you for the working and moving of your Holy Spirit and your holy angels. We ask, Lord, for answers and direction, eyes and ears and hearts and minds to see and receive. And we release faith and we thank you for it, lay hold of it, and we thank you for the results in Jesus' name. And for every good thing that happens, we'll testify and tell everybody that'll listen that you did it. You did it. You're the good and great God. Amen. 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 In Habakkuk 2, you find in the latter part of the verse a phrase that we're very familiar with in our circles. You'll find it repeated at least three times, I'm aware of, in the New Testament. And I believe this is one of the first times you see it in the Bible. So the Spirit of God is quoting in the New Testament from here. Uh, it said, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Why don't you say that last phrase out loud with me? But the just shall live by his faith. Now, one thing to note here is uh, we're used to quoting it, the just shall live by faith. But when you look at the original source verse, it says by his faith. And that is significant because truth be told, you cannot live on anyone else's faith as an adult. When uh, children are very small, parents can receive for them just like you receive, they're receiving for themselves. So the child can uh, get things just based on the parent's faith. But even that child, as that child gets older, especially, you know, 15 years old and in their teens and especially later, they can't just ride mom and daddy's faith anymore. They'll, they may try, but you can't. Now, mom and daddy can believe with you, but they can't just believe for you all your life, the Lord expects us, everyone, to individually trust Him and come to know Him and have a relationship with Him. Uh, faith is inseparable from vision. If you say, I'm believing, I'm in faith about something, well, what? What are we believing for? That's where your vision comes in. Your vision uh, your faith produces your vision. You can say it like that. And so, even though something may be very clear to someone else, you can't live off of their vision. You can't function off of their faith. Now, their faith can inspire you. Their vision can enlighten and inspire you. And you can uh, get to the place where it's your vision too. But you've got to see it for yourself. And it's a big mistake to pretend to see something when you don't. Now, the first part of this verse says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. Uh, another translation says it like this. The NAS, the New American, says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him but the righteous will live by his faith. Well, now, why are we talking about pride in the same verse of talking about living by faith? I've come now, after a few years of walking with the Lord, to see this clearer and clearer. One of the biggest enemies of our faith is pride. It, it, it stands in direct opposition to living by faith. And it is a most subtle thing, this pride. There's no such thing as, as a person, a man or woman, 
who's never had to deal with pride. No such thing. There's no such thing as a man or woman who prayed enough and grew enough that they no longer have any challenges with pride. No longer, they, they overcame it one day and, and now we're, no, no, because it has to do with the flesh and the unrenewed mind. When you got born again, it wasn't your flesh that got born again. Hmm? You got the same kind of flesh in every detail as Joe Sinner's flesh. And I, I don't know if you realized it or not, but your flesh, not somebody else's, your flesh will do anything you let it do. Hmm? You can't trust it any further than you can throw it. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 9, he said, uh, I keep under my body. I bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means after I've preached to others, I should be a castaway. So he's a very spiritual man. How many think Paul's a spiritual man? And he's saying, I have to keep my body under control all the time or I can wind up, even after I've done all this and preached all this, I can wind up disqualified. Any of us can yield to our flesh and do stupid stuff anytime we choose to. There's a very simple word you need to use on your flesh on a regular basis. N-O. N-O. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about or not? Yeah, don't sit there and look so sanctified. You know what exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> But pride goes with pride is connected to this flesh. You know, the scripture uh, cautions us, warns us in 1 John 2, not to love this world, nor the things that are in this world. Then he mentions three major categories that cover that. The, the, the lust or desire of the flesh, the lust or desire of the eyes, and what was that, what was that last one? Anybody remember? The pride of life. The what? The pride. Well, this has big time to do with the flesh. And other translations bring out that it is the ostentatiousness of life. Or one says the showiness. Showiness. Pride is a pretender. Pride is a faker. Pride is phony. Pride is a liar. Does anybody, any of this sound like somebody that you've heard about? The proudest being we know anything about is the devil himself. He is the proudest being. Uh, arrogant. Oh, he just, and God hates it. He ha I didn't say he hated proud people. He hates pride because it is the very nature of the evil one. Well, if he hates it, we should hate it. If he despises it, we should despise what he despises. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this. I actually had a, a, a minister who's a friend of mine. He's a wonderful minister too. And he heard some of my teaching on this and he said, now, Brother Keith, I mean, you got some, you got some good pride and bad pride, right? I mean, because I mean, like we're proud of, uh, proud to be an American, and I'm proud of my kids. And he said, "All right, so you got, you got." I said, mm -mm, "No, huh? No. If it's the nature of the devil, how how can there be a good version of it? You know." Somebody said, well, I'm proud of my kids. I don't care what you say. Well, the Lord will deliver you if you'll listen. <laughs> what do you mean? When, when Jesus was 30 years old and he was baptized in the river and the Holy Spirit came on, what did the Father say? This is my beloved son. I'm so proud of him. Huh? What? I'm so proud of him. No. No. You can be thankful for your children, you can be grateful, you can be pleased, 
But if you're proud, you've crossed a line into something else. Because why? They're your kids. Can you see this? It's a way of being proud of yourself. Because they came from you. Can you see this? I'm so proud of my baby. Are you proud of yourself? For producing this. <laughs> Just, just think about it, okay? But if it's the nature of the enemy, how much of it do you want? Come on, help me. Do you, how much? You don't want any of it. Any of it. And Jesus, he said this when he said, come learn about me. You know, come to me. You that are, are burdened, you're heavy loaded, and, and, you, and you'll find rest. He said, learn about me. I'm what? Meek and lowly, and you'll find rest for your souls. One of the, there's a lot of things there, but one of the things is it's uh, fatiguing maintaining a front. Did you know that? It's exhausting maintaining a facade. I've heard people say to me, you know, on a trip or something, they say, oh man, I'll be so glad when I can get back home and just let down my hair and just be myself. And I thought, well, who you been being out here with us? And we laugh, but people do. They put, there's, there are folks that put on their church face. And then they put on another face when they're here, and another face when they're there. That's uh, no bueno. That's no good. Y'all with me or not? That's, that's no good. Because uh, who, whose are those characteristics? The Bible said that, you know, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And in that same passage, it talks about this, that the devil is transformed into an angel of light. And even his ministers are transformed in, as ministers of righteousness. The devil is the best actor there has ever been. He's the best pretender. He, you talking about taking on a role and lying. He invented lying. God did not invent deception. The devil himself fathered lying. It's, it's his. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He speaks what he fathered. And notice how much truth is associated with God. We preach the word of truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Jesus is the way, the life, and the truth. Is that right? Truth, truth, truth. There is no shadow of turning. There is no, uh, not a bit of deception or falseness or facade with him. And when, if we try to come to him with the front, he doesn't hear it. He doesn't hear it. Falseness is like a wall between you. In order to commune with God, to, to catch a phrase from a few years back, you must get real. If, if you want to get, get right with God, you want to get close with him, you cannot play games. Because other people might not know. You may fool them, but you can't fool him. I mean, all things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom he have to do. He sees right through all of it. He sees right into your heart. And if you want to get close, you've got to get honest and genuine and sincere, which also happens to be one of the biggest characteristics of humility. You show me a humble person, I'll show you an honest person. They, they are inseparable. And like we've already said, pride and pretending are connected. Go with me please to James, the fourth chapter. James chapter four, and notice this. In verse uh, 6, James 4, 6 says, But he, God, gives more grace. More, everybody say more grace. more grace. 
more grace. grace. I've had people ask me, you know, well now, you know, there's been a real shift and a change. Are you still a faith person? (laughs) Are you a grace person? Grace or faith? Grace person? Faith person. And I always say, yes. (laughs) What do you mean? You can't really be one. I need to take that really out. You can't be one without the other. You're not going to have a successful life if all you talk about is grace and you have no faith and you don't function in faith because you're trying to leave it all up to God. People have been trying to do that for generations. It didn't work then. It won't work now. The devil always tries to repackage things for an ignorant new generation. But it's the same old stuff that he fooled people with hundreds of years ago. I call it grace only. That means it's all up to God. People say, well, the biggest thing we need to do is just let go and let God. That is not a scripture. (laughs) Oh, y'all need some help on this, don't you? How many know that's not a scripture? Let go and let God? That, that's not a scripture. <laughs> if you're talking about quit worrying, cast your cares over on the Lord, yeah, you, you need to let go of that. That's for sure. But how many remember what the scripture says? Fight the good fight of faith. Does anybody remember the rest of the verse? What does it say? Huh? Fight the good. What's that reference? Yeah, I think you're right. Yes, sir. First Timothy 6, 12. See if that's right. First Timothy 6, 12. Can we put it up? It's coming. What does it say? Fight the good fight of faith. Let go. Huh? Let, just let go and let God. Huh? Let's try it again. Fight. Read it out. Fight. The good fight of faith. Let go. Huh? Let go. Well, let go, lay hold's about the same, right? Are they about the same? They're not the same at all. No. There are things God doesn't do for us. He doesn't receive for us. And he doesn't resist the enemy for us. These are two big ones. You got to stop begging God to make the devil quit. Hmm? Because he told us, you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You understand what I'm talking about? See, I'm just bringing this up because there are folks who go too far and they keep trying to say it's all up to God. Everything's all up to God. What we need to do is just get out of God's way. That's not true. We got a part. Our part's faith. Grace is his part. Faith is our part. We can't do his part. He won't do our part. So are you a grace person or a faith person? Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. Because, yes, you got to have faith, but you wouldn't even know about faith if it wasn't for grace. You wouldn't have any ability to have faith if it wasn't for grace. Uh, It was grace that allowed you to hear the word. It was grace that allowed you to understand it. It was grace, and grace is gift. You can sum it all up in that word. Every, all of God's grace that's been given, all of it's a gift. Gift. Gifts have to be. Only gifts you enjoy, though, are the ones you receive. Yes, sir. I receive it. I take it. That's the only ones you enjoy. And, and how do you receive it? Faith is the hand that lays hold and receives. Praise God. But... In, uh, in James, did I tell you to go there or not? Yes. <laughs> James 4 and 6, 
God does what? He gives more grace. There's always more to receive from God. He's always ready to give you more. And we need more. More of his help. I use that word from myself a lot of times in talking about grace because it, to, to me it sums up. His grace, it's a giant word. It's his ability, it's his strength, it's his help. And with enough of God's help, grace, you can do anything. You can overcome anything. You can receive anything. Somebody says, well, with enough faith. That's what I just said. Because you got to have the grace to get to faith. They're connected. But if you've been endeavoring to believe for something and just coming short of it, coming short of it, it's too, it looks too big to you, too hard to you, what you need is more grace. Anybody agree with me on this? You, you need more of God's help, right? His strength, his quickening, and he has so many ways to help us. And you can get to the place where what used to seem impossible, unreachable, begins to seem, okay, okay. there it is. I believe God could do that, right? You, you, you're changing. Your faith has come up to where somebody else's faith is that received it. If you've been struggling with a habit and you just keep yielding to the same thing over and over and over again, uh, uh, one great thing about this is when God forgives you, he's not keeping track of all the previous failures. He's not. He's not. He said, your sins and iniquities, I will remember. No more. And so when you come to him and you say, Lord, I am, I am so sorry for acting stupid. I get, what is this? Time 342nd time I have done this. And, and he, if you listen to him, he'll say, I, I, I don't see that. I don't see that. We're, we're dealing with this. This one, somebody said, we're not, we're not dealing with anything because Jesus already paid the price. No, 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 we are. You violated light. He did already pay the price, but you got to receive your forgiveness. You got to receive your cleansing or you'll continue walking in condemnation. It's not about getting God to do something else. It has been done. But there are people totally lost on the planet, even though Jesus has already paid the price for all their sins. Right? Why? They haven't received it. You got to receive it. Let's just act on it right now. We've all, you know, made mistakes here and there, but just say it out loud. I receive complete forgiveness, complete washing, by the blood of the Lamb. The of the Lamb. I, receive I receive the righteousness of Christ, righteousness. As, my as my own. He has made me, he has made me clean, clean in the sight of God. Sight of God. Hallelujah. 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 If you violate light tomorrow or the next day, no. Nothing else needs to be paid for your sin. But what does need to happen? You need to receive. You need to receive of that cleansing and forgiveness or elsewise your heart, not God, your heart will condemn you for violating light. Can you see this, friends? How did we get into there? Well, anyway, James, are you still there? James 4? With enough of God's grace and help, you can overcome anything. Hmm? Maybe it seems like you've been too weak to resist that thing and keep falling into it. With more grace, the next time you could resist it and that be the end of it. With more grace and more help. But here's the thing. Not everyone gets God's grace. That's a big statement. But read the rest of the verse. God gives more grace, wherefore he says God does what? Resist. He resists the proud. Do they get his grace? No. no. It's available, but they're not going to get it. 
until they change. You think about a person, one of the biggest reasons why people that are not born again are not born again. Because it requires humbling yourself to receive Jesus as Lord. Can you see that? And that's why people cling to these lies of godless evolution and all these other things. Why? Because if there's no God, I'm not responsible to anybody. I'm in control of myself. But if there is a creator and, and he made your lungs and you're breathing his air and his gravity is holding your feet on the ground, what should you do? You should acknowledge him, right? You should acknowledge him. And if he tells you the only way to him is through his son whom he has given, you should respect that and you should believe that, right? And you should humble yourself and acknowledge that without him, you are hopelessly lost and you can't save yourself. That requires humility. You can't stand with your nose in the air in arrogance and do that. And you got to humble yourself and say, I receive Jesus as Lord of my life. I confess you, Lord. Lord, that means I'm not my own Lord anymore. This is one of the biggest reasons why people are lost is a refusal because the devil, beginning with Adam and Eve, was able to breathe his defiant, rebellious pride into them. Listen to the phrase, if you take of this fruit, you'll, you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. The implication is you won't need God anymore. Such lies. The truth is, we need our good God every millisecond of our existence. Do we or not? Oh, if you don't think so, you are deceived. Huh? Look at your neighbor, help him out and say, you need help. You need, you need help. You need help. You can tell them, I know it. But then go on and say this, I have help. Who am I talking I'm talking about the capital H, helper. The Holy Spirit, the comforter that the Lord sent and gave to us. But the thing is, he helps, the Holy Spirit helps some people a whole lot more than he does other people. And the reason being is because some have learned to look to him and listen to him and yield to him and others do it mostly on their own. Their mentality, even Christians I'm talking about, their mentality is, well, God, you know, if something big comes up, I'll, I'll check with you. But I got this. I got this. We, I've been doing this, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. I got it. No, you ain't got it. You, you may think you do, but you don't got it. You need his help. Hmm, every hour of every day. You need his, you can't do anything the way you should do it, the way it could be done without the help of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> In order to get that help, we cannot be proud, he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Then the very next verse says what? Submit yourselves to God. Then, having humbled yourself and having submitted yourself to God, grace flows to you. Grace is connected to your faith. Now you are in a position to resist the devil. And he has to flee when you do it this way. Look in Proverbs, please, the third chapter. Proverbs chapter 3. And verse five, let me give you a couple of uh, identifiers for pride. One of, the, one of the first revelations I got as a believer was, was right here. I was, uh, I must have been about 10 years old. And my grandmother's a godly woman and influence in uh, my, my life. 
It encouraged me to read the Bible for myself, starting at Genesis and go through. And I got to Numbers 12.3. Put it up, if you would, on the screen. Numbers 12.3, just reading the Bible through as a boy for myself. And I got to this, Numbers 12.3. It says, now the man Moses was what? Very meek above all the men which were on the face of the earth. And as I read that, the Spirit of God, I don't mean to heard an audible voice, but to me it was very distinct and clear. He said to me, Keith, did you notice Moses was the meekest man, most humble man in his generation? I thought, yes, I'm a 10-year-old boy. He said, do you also realize he was the most used man of me in his generation? I think that's beyond dispute. The most used man of God was the most humble man on the planet. Is this significant? Boy, it stood out to me. And from that point, uh, I didn't realize then, but several years later, the Lord brought it up to me and stirred me about it. And I saw, I don't know what either one of these are, pride or humility. I don't, I don't know enough about them. I, and I, 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 I prayed a prayer to, uh, Lord, show me what is pride and show me what is humility. And it seemed like uh, every other day he was showing me something else, characteristics and qualities. Here, here's a couple of them. Pride, we've already said it, but pride pretends and is phony. You don't want to be a pretender. Humility is honest. Everybody say honest. honest. Honest and real. Another thing here, you cannot have honor without honesty. Can't have one without the other. Pride hides and covers. Humility is open and revealing. Here's another one. Pride presumes and assumes. Humility asks and inquires. Pride presumes. Humility asks. See, the reason so many times folks don't ask the Lord, and we've all missed it in this area, but it's because you think you already know enough to get it. Huh? But if we're more aware of what God knows versus what we know, we'll be asking him a whole lot more. And here it says, Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with what? All your heart. All your heart. That's humility. Yeah. Lean not to your own understanding. Well, if you're just leaning to your own understanding, relying on it alone, that's pride. Thinking you got it without help. Verse 6, in all your ways, in the big things. Huh? In, in the big stuff, acknowledge him. You ever heard people say this? You know, well, we've done everything we know to do, and I guess all we can do now is, is pray. <laughs> Has it come to that? <laughs> do you agree? That's the first thing. Not the last thing. That's the first thing you should do is go straight to him and inquire of the Lord. Amen. Even when you think, even when you've done it for 20 years, go back to him because this is a new day. There, there could be all kinds of things you're not aware of going on, Amen. especially in the spirit and, and especially in the future. You don't know what the future holds. You know, David, you see King David's life, he often inquired of the Lord, didn't he? You remember that? Often, he'd inquire of the Lord. And usually, it had to do with the Philistines coming. Remember that? Philistines have come out against us. Well, them Philistines are mean ones, huh? And uh, he, uh, he would inquire of the Lord. Now, if you look at the, his, his history, year after year, this had happened. And, and the Lord gave him the same answer. Many times, go out against them. You'll be successful. You'll be victorious. So he did, and he was. But you'll find even after he had done it many times, still, when they'd show up, what would he do again? 
go inquire of the Lord. And on a later occasion, it's sure good that he did because he said, Lord, should I go out against them? And the Lord said, no. Go around behind the mulberry trees and do it like this. Even though you've done it the same way and the Lord told you to do it the same way. For 30 times doesn't mean he's not going to tell you something different this time. I said earlier, if somebody, you know, if a group of the best preachers in the world come out with a thousand volume set of reference books, what to do in every situation. Save your money. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. Because if it could do it, you wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. And you need, the Lord knew you needed the Holy Spirit. He gave you the Holy Spirit. You got to watch about writing a bunch of rules and writing a bunch of things. You got to hear from him. Every day is a new day. It's a new situation. Nothing can take the place of getting direction straight from him. But you won't get it if you don't even look for it. You won't get it if you don't even ask for it. What does this say here? In the big things. First of all. I'm still not right, right? In, in what? In all your ways, acknowledge him. How many? How many? How do you do that? In all your ways, acknowledge him. That means you're, where, where is he? He's not in your flesh. He's not in your head. He's not in your head. He's in your spirit. Romans 8 says, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the, the children of God. So you should be checking in your heart, looking for a witness or a check or something from him. And this should be something we do many times a day. Especially when we come up to something to make a decision about it. We come up to any kind of decision, any kind of thing, go left, go right. You do not just look at statistics or at this or at that. There's only one way to get it right. You can do research uh, for years. You can have the best folks in the world helping you, and you can never know enough to make the right decision based solely on gathered knowledge. Because there's still most of it you don't know, and you certainly don't know the future. So how can you make the right choice? There's only one way. Only one way. By the leading of the Spirit. Come on, help me out loud. Say, I am led, I am led by, the Spirit of God. by the Spirit of God. Now, in order to do that, you can't lean to your own understanding, and that means you can't be led by a whole host of other things. You can't be led by price. Huh? Anybody know that or not? A lot of folks, you know, they look at the menu and the first thing they look at is the right side. And, and there are people that have had a car accident going 10 miles across town to save a nickel uh, on a gallon of gas. And we're at the wrong place at the wrong time. Y'all with me or not? Why? Because you're being led by a nickel. If you're being led by a nickel, you're not being led by the Holy Spirit. True or not true? We should not be led by needs. Needs. We should not be led by opportunities. Well, this is a great opportunity. This is a fabulous opportunity. That don't mean it's the direction of the Lord. You're not the only person that can do something. God's got a lot of people. You're one person with X amount of time and resources, right? The only way to get it right is to be led by the Spirit. And um, I've had people that's gotten perturbed with me before because they said, well, why wouldn't you do this meeting with us? Or why wouldn't you do this project with us? Or why? I don't re need a reason not to do something. I need a witness to do it. I'm gonna go over again that real slow. Huh? 
I've had people get mad at me. Well, why wouldn't you do this? Why wouldn't you? This is a great need. It's a great opportunity. I don't doubt that. But remember what Jesus said? I only say what I hear the Father say. I only do what I see him do. So he wouldn't do just anything and everything. Was he led by needs, opportunities, et cetera, et cetera? No, no. I don't need a reason not to do something. I need to discipline myself and only do what I have a witness and direction and a quickening to do. Oh, friend, this will simplify your life. This will help you so much because people will pull on you. Hmm? Family, friends, coworkers will pull on you. Pull on. Yeah, but we're friends. We're fri You're not supposed to be led by that. You're supposed to be led by the Spirit with family. There are uh, children and grandchildren that the enemy uses to impoverish their parents and grandparents because they just keep on asking and asking and asking and they just keep on giving. Why? Well, they're my kids. I have to. If you'd listen to the Lord, there'd be times he'd tell you no. Yeah, but it's my kid. You're going to put them ahead of God. Or are you going to listen to him? There are times he would let them get hungry. But you won't. Why? Because they'd look to him. They'd have to look to him instead of you, and it won't ever get fixed until that happens. Don't be led by needs. Don't be led by opportunities. Don't be led by price. Don't be led by uh, crying and pitiful stories. Now, with me, now you, you got to have some strength about you. You do. Are you smarter than God? No. So we're talking about pride here now. Yeah, but that's my, that's my, that's my, it's, it's not yours. You don't own them. He does. Amen. You had the stewardship to help them for a while, but no child is your possession. Your spouse is not your possession. They belong to him. And only he knows the best way to deal with them and the best thing. Amen. And you can, in, in, in all love, you can say with kindness, no. <laughs> what am I going to do? Well, we all have the same source. Do we or not? Yes. We all have the same source. What am I going to do? Well, look to the Lord. Oh, boy. <laughs> Are we talking about pride and humility? Are we talking about being led? Being led. Said out loud, just make a good confession. Said out loud, I have the Spirit of God inside me. He leads me and He guides me. I refuse to be led by circumstances, feelings, needs, price, opportunities people pulling on me. I insist. I choose to follow only the leading of the Spirit. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Go with me, please, in closing, I think. To John chapter 5. Have you got just a couple more minutes or are you, or are you done? John 5 and 30. We've quoted this, but let's, uh, let's read it. John 5, 30, Jesus said, I can of my own self do what? Not much. What? Most church-going people do not believe that. They believe something else. They believe Jesus 
functioned as God when he was on the earth. That's how he walked on the water. That's how he raised the dead. And uh, he could do anything he wanted to anywhere at any time. But according to Jesus, that's not true. According to himself, how, what could he do just because he decided to do it? Nothing. Nothing of my own self. You put this with the other scriptures. He relied completely on the Father showing him by the Holy Spirit what to say, what to do. <clears throat> and if you skip down to the, uh, uh, what is it, 42 or so? Well, 43. He said, I'm come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. <clears throat> How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from God only? Do you hear the question? What it, this is the head of the church. He's saying, how are you able to believe? Look at the Amplified on that. The Amplified, I believe we can get that on the screen there. Uh, verse 44, I've come... Well, skip down to verse 44, please. Uh, how is it possible for you to believe? How can you learn to believe? You who are content to seek and receive praise and honor and glory from one another, and you don't seek the praise and honor and glory which comes from him who alone is God. <clears throat> this desire to impress, this fear of being embarrassed, this drive to pretend and put on a facade needs to die in our life. It, it stands in between us and living the life of faith. Can you see Jesus' words? How is it possible for you to believe when you're seeking the honor and glory from men when he says in Habakkuk, uh, if you're proud and upright, your soul's not right, but the just shall live by his faith. There are people in our camp, Word and Faith camp, and that's my camp, that should still be with us, but they tried, they tried to pretend they were at a faith level that they were not at and refused help, refused to even acknowledge they had a problem. How many understand sticking your head in the sand and pretending there's no problem has got nothing to do with faith? No. Pretending has nothing to do with faith. A good friend of mine, have you got an extra couple of minutes for a story? Yes. Yes. Elder minister, wonderful man. He came from an old school group and uh, he, had, he had a thing in his body. At this point, he was in his uh, late 70s and he had a thing in his body that the doctor told him they could do a procedure for and it was no big deal. He'd be fine. But he, he wouldn't do it. He, he, he went month after month. And, and I knew him. We talked every week or so. And so uh, one day the Lord impressed me to just go in and talk to him about it. So I sat down with him and uh, I asked him about it. He told me, wonderful dear man. He said, I just, I don't want to displease the Lord. And I know faith pleases him. And I don't want to use any means. I just want to trust him alone. I said, I understand that. I understand that. I said, but we don't receive according to what God can do. We receive according to our faith, where our faith is. And so I, I talked about where, you know, how, when you think about not doing it, do you have fear? Are you confident? Well, I, the reason I asked, I could tell he had fear. He's not confident. And the Lord gave me this. I said, well, brother, I said, have you ever got a splinter in your finger or hand? He said, yeah, not too long ago. I said, uh, how'd you get it out? He said, well, I took some alcohol and, and, a, and a needle and some tweezers and I got that thing. I said, wasn't that using means? <laughs> means? I said, why didn't you just believe for it to dematerialize? <laughs> could God make it dematerialize? For sure he could. But is that what, 
How could you have faith for it to dematerialize? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If in a time of prayer or just communion with the Lord, He spoke to you to speak to it to dematerialize, faith had come from that, and you could do that. But if you don't have that, pretending like you do is a giant mistake. He sat back in his chair. He said, well, that is using means, isn't it? I said, yeah. I don't reckon the Lord was displeased with that, was he? He said, I don't think so. I said, well, how is this that much different from that? I said, the big thing is confidence. Where's your confidence? When you think about not doing it, are you fully confident that you're going to be fine, that there's no issue, or have you not been able to shake the fear? When you think about doing it, can you see God getting involved, even with the doctors and speeding up the healing process? Can you see yourself coming out of it? Good. Where do you have the more confidence? He said, I, I got more confidence with the procedure. I said, that's not a problem. It's not believe God or. We're going to believe God with. Right? We're not, we're not going to let them roll you in there in that cold operating room and not have prayed and released faith. Right? We're going to get God involved in this thing. Amen. That is a level of faith. Amen. It's not the highest level of faith, but it's a level of faith. Yes. Brother Hagin said one of the visions where he saw the Lord in an open vision. He said he saw him just like he sees another human being. He said the head of the church, Jesus, told him this. He said, anytime any of my people have procedures done, ask me to speed up the healing process working in their bodies. You believe that or not? Amen. He said the head of the church told him that. Well, he didn't just say, don't go to the doctor, just trust me, because he knows people's faith is at all different places. And so we've seen marvelous results with this, praying with our people in, in different situations. We, we do it like this. If somebody's going to have a procedure the next day, after we've, they, they have decided that that's what they should do, well, then we say, Lord, we pray your hand on the surgeons and on their assistants and on the nurses. We ask you help them to get the best rest they have ever had. And when they do the procedure, guide them, Lord. We pray your hand on their mind, on their brain, their body, their fingers, their equipment, their, their, their instruments. Keep them back from making any mistakes. Anything they should not do, arrest them, check them. Anything they don't know about, reveal it to them and guide them in it. Help them to do of the best work they have ever done in their life. And Lord, afterwards we ask you, speed up the healing process, working in their bodies, help them to heal up supernaturally fast and supernaturally complete. And we have seen, now let me tell you about one such thing that happened on that. There was a man when I was in healing school had an inoperable brain tumor. And uh, I mean, no, nobody would touch it. No surgeon, no, no clinic, no matter where he went, they said, it's inoperable, we won't touch it. Well, a guy at the City of Faith, that's back when the City of Faith at Burrow Oral Roberts, a believer, a surgeon, said he would do it. Well, we prayed before he went, about, I guess it was about two weeks before he went, and we laid hands on his head and cursed that thing Commanded to die from the roots. Just like Jesus did, you know, that fig tree. And, uh, and, and I talked with him after, but he said, I, I still feel like I need to have the procedure. I said, that's fine. How many understand we need to be led in these things? There, there's no one answer for everything. I, I said, fine. And so we prayed like that. Well, they told us later, the surgeon, they got in there, they got to it, and sure enough, they said the thing had tentacles down into the brain in multiple places. You couldn't get it out without just destroying the brain. That's why nobody would touch it. They had seen scans of it. Now, is that devilish or is that devilish? That's the devil. And so they worked and worked, I forget, hours, and finally just kind of fatigued, they stepped back and rested just a minute and, and, and conversed about it, and they went back, and they touched it, and it fell out. <laughs> they, just, they just took the instrument and just pulled it completely out. 
and, and the tips of the tentacles were dead. They had died. And they just pulled it all out and just sewed him back up and he was good to go. Healed up perfectly. Super. Now, could God have made that dematerialize in there? He could. He's done things like that. He does things like that. But we, we're, we're getting nowhere pretending that we see something that somebody else saw or that our faith is just like somebody else's faith when we didn't hear what they heard. Can you see this? Every case is a, stands on its own. Every day is a new day, different circumstances. But what we can do is humble ourselves, acknowledge our need, and get grace. And with enough grace, we can get through anything. With enough grace, we can receive anything. Can you say amen? 